Good morning. My name is Felicia Orth, a hearing officer appointed by the New Mexico Environmental Improvement Board to conduct a hearing in EIB 21-27. The this is a rulemaking uh, concerning ozone precursor air pollutants. We begin every morning. This is day seven of the hearing. Uh, we begin every morning with public comment uh, at every day of the hearing at 9 a.m., 1 p.m., and 5 p.m. Uh, the uh, best way to uh, have me call on you uh, is to reach out to the board's administrator, Pam Jones. Her contact information is on the EIB webpage. Uh, otherwise, if you're on this platform and um, did not reach out by email, I'm still happy to take your comment. Just reach out in the chat, which is enabled for everyone, or call or text Pam uh, at her number, 505-660-4305. Uh, public comment is taken uh, under oath, pursuant to the board's rules, is taken by audio rather than video, and is limited to five minutes. I'll call on you in this order. Uh, Nate Duckett, Gay Kernan, Harvin Conrad, David Koss, and Marla Mead. Uh, and again, um, anyone else who reaches out through chat. Uh, so let me start with Mr. <coughs> Duckett. Excuse me. Uh, Mr. Duckett, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Terrific, I can hear you clearly. If you would please spell your name. Sure, my name is Nate, N-A-T-E. My last name is Duckett, D-U-C-K-E-T-T. -T. Thank you very much. Uh, and if you would raise your right hand, do you swear or affirm that you will tell the truth? I do. Thank you, I'll start your five minutes now. Thank you, Ms. Forth. My name is Nate Duckett. I'm the mayor of Farmington, New Mexico. And I appreciate this opportunity to speak to the board regarding the methane rules that are being considered. My emphasis as the mayor uh, of this beautiful city in Northwest New Mexico really builds around the economy that has been built by the oil and gas industry. Uh, the oil and gas industry has provided opportunities for hundreds of thousands of individuals who've lived in this community to make a quality life for themselves and their family, providing a future for their children and has supported communities across this state through the extraction and production of, of these important natural resources. Um, my concern is any type of additional onerous regulations that would go above and beyond maybe what the feds are requiring, uh, but certainly to the point where these wells that exist in San Juan Basin, which are marginally produced wells, so they're not, they're not producing a high amount of natural gas or barrels of oil a day, they are very sensitive to price changes and to costs associated with their operation. My concern is that if we see a rule get in place where these stripper wells, as many of them are called here in our area, were to come under a, you know, a high dollar requirement to institute new technologies, um, we could see a number of these wells shut down, which could lead to a large job loss in our area. You know, the, the northwest corner of the state has been blessed with an abundance of natural resources from natural gas, oil, and coal. And what has happened over the last 10 to 15 years is an attack on those industries. And we've seen an exodus of individuals from San Juan County. The most recent, recent census shows that we've lost close to 8,000 uh, members of our local community. Uh, our local community's area extends beyond the borders of this county. It goes into southwest Colorado, southeast Utah, north. East Arizona and is an important, important driver for local economies in all of those areas. So, I would just ask the board to be, be aware of those concerns. Uh, we cannot afford to lose more individuals from our city or county, let alone this state as we focus efforts on the energy industry that may, that may be not conducive to making this an area that where we can continue to be competitive. Uh, and provide high quality jobs, not just direct jobs, but indirect jobs, which are so critical and allow us a true transition that is not one that is just a jump off the cliff type mentality. So uh, that is my that was my statement for the board. I appreciate your time. I know that they will will do their best to take everybody's comments 
and concerns into it. I just want to make sure that they leave leeway for the industry to drive innovation, spurring new ideas and things that will help will help our local economy and address uh, the growing concerns with methane. Um, also, final note, my apologies. We are looking here in the northwest corner of the state as being a hub. The federal government is looking for hydrogen hubs and natural gas is a critical component for the production of hydrogen. And we would certainly not want to add any additional costs to that as we continue as we do a transition into the hydrogen economy. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. We will move then to uh, Senator Kernan. Uh, let's see here. Senator Kernan, I've unmuted you. Can you hear me? Thank you. Yes, I can. Thank you very much. Oh, you're coming through nice and clearly. Uh, if you would please spell your name for the transcript. G A Y K E R N A N. Thank you. And raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm to tell the truth? Yes. Thank you very much. I'll start your five minutes now. Good morning. My name is Senator Gay Kernan. I represent Senate District 42, which includes Lee, Eddy, and Chavez counties. I've been a member of the New Mexico legislature for 19 years and currently serve on the Legislative Finance Committee. And during the regular session, I serve on the Senate Education Committee and the Tax Business and Transportation Committee. I'm a lifelong resident of Hobbs, and I have a deep and abiding interest in the community that I serve. This includes the many men and women who are part of the oil and gas industry in Southeast New Mexico. My family moved to New Mexico in the 1950s, where my father established a rental tool company, supporting the activities of the industry. In 1986, upon his death, I had the responsibility of operating his lease that consisted of five marginal wells. Maintaining the lease was exceptionally challenging for, as you may recall, the plight of the oil and gas industry in 1986 was dire. I worked hard to learn as much as possible about the operation of a well by taking classes at the New Mexico Junior College. It was important to me to maintain the lease and protect my father's investment until I was able to transfer the lease to new ownership. Today, I speak to you with considerable concern for the industry that has provided so much to my community, to the state of New Mexico, and to the country in general by producing over a million barrels of oil a day to support the many needs that oil and gas provide for our daily use, both as an energy source and a source for the manufacturing of many goods, too numerous to name. I have reviewed a significant amount of information related to this issue, much of which has already been presented to this board. What I think I have learned relative to the New Mexico Environment Department's proposed ozone precursor rule is that it is a methane rule disguised as an ozone rule. This rule is attempting to control both NOx and VOX. The degree controls that NMED proposes on VOX is not justified in reducing ozone emissions. They are costly and somewhat limited in reducing those levels. My question to the board is, would the rural reduce ozone levels sufficiently to meet the national ambient air quality standards? Any rural proposed by NMED should consider the technical practicability and economic reasonableness consistent with statutory authority for rulemaking. This brings me to two additional points that I would like to make. First, the determination by the Legislative Finance Committee that the state stands to lose over $1 billion in revenue should the proposed rule be adopted. Secretary Kenny discounts the study of JDA as deeply flawed and in his response to the LFC cites an economic forecast that New Mexico is expecting to re receive close to $1.4 billion in new revenues. In my view, those revenues are dependent only on a strong oil and gas industry. If this rule is adopted as is, the independent producers who are my friends, my constituents, and my fellow New Mexicans who have long contributed to the wealth of this state will be unfairly impacted and many will be forced out of the industry. And the revenue to the state will be reduced at a significant level. My second point is related to the constitutional requirement that all children in the state of New Mexico receive a sufficient education. Although we spend close to 45% of our state revenues on education, we continue to be under the judicial order of the Martinez-Yazzie lawsuit. 
For those on the board who have deep appreciation and understanding of our educational system, we cannot adequately provide for the educational needs of our children without the revenue the industry provides. A $1 billion loss in revenue will make it impossible to address the requirements of Martina Yossi. I propose to the Environmental Improvement Board that you reconsider the agency's original agreement with industry to allow once in a lifetime inspection of wells that emit less than two tons of pollutants per year. This will allow smaller operators and low emitting wells to continue production. The small business exemption that replaced the original exemption is meaningless. I would also ask the board to consider whether New Mexico by creating a methane rule that sets an industry standard as the most stringent oil and gas regulation across the country will produce any significant benefit related to emissions nationwide or worldwide, yet it will put New Mexico at a disadvantage when looking at the prosperity and quality of life compared to our neighboring states. I thank you very much for allowing me to submit my testimony. Thank you, Senator. Uh, we move next to Harvin Conrad. Uh, Mr. Conrad, can you hear me? Uh, yes, and it's Ms. Conrad. Thank you. Very sorry. Um, uh, if you would please spell your name for the transcript. Yes, my name is Harvin, H-A-R-V-A-N. Last name is Conrad, C-O-N-R-A-D. And if you'd raise your right hand, do you swear or affirm to tell the truth? Yes, I do. Thank you. I'll start your five minutes now. Thank you. Um, I, I would like to preface my comments by stating that I live in Magdalena, New Mexico, um, having recently retired from 44 years in the oil and gas industry as a quality manager, which includes the fields of mechanical integrity and failure analysis. I am well aware that as in many other places in New Mexico, the oil and gas industry uh, contributes significantly to the release of methane into the atmosphere, which is contributing to climate warming, which is a serious matter that we need to take into account for ourselves and our future generations. I am also well aware, as from inside the industry, that there are several comments that this this these changes would cause a significant impact to the oil and gas industry and would not provide a lot of benefit. But I have read over the years and contributed to over the years, um, many reports that show otherwise that working to reduce uh, outgassing to stop leaks on the pneumatic and other equipment not only is not such a severe impact to the oil and gas industry as we might believe, but it also contributes to increasing their profits. They are a hugely profitable industry and I do not see a significant cost impact in making these changes. In addition, the industry is replete with assets for um, research and development. They have highly educated engineers and chemists and people that can do the research and find ways to reduce these emissions and to significantly improve the manufacture of oil and gas for our society and all the other elements that come from that without significantly impacting the earth, the climate and our quality of life. And so I believe that these rules are not going to significantly impact them. I've heard many dollar costs, but I think when we hear those dollar costs, we should also take into account the significant dollar profits that these companies make. And I, I, I when I compare those two, I do not see a significant challenge to the oil, oil and gas industry. And as far as causing costing jobs and 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 reducing our profits by the to the state I, I think we should take a look at some other states especially our neighbor to the north colorado who has already implemented rules and they are not seeing a significant challenge to uh, employment or cost of living so i i think that in in the end these rules will benefit us climate change is a serious problem that we need to start looking at seriously. The oil and gas industry is well positioned to do research and development into how to continue to provide us with oil and gas and all of the 
elements that they create for our society, the plastics, the fibers and everything, and, and do it in a way that does not significantly, significantly impact our lives, our climate and the earth itself. As having worked in the industry for 44 years, I'm well aware, I believe that this is significantly possible without impacting their bottom line dollar profits in a significant way. And it would be beneficial to all of us. I've also seen, as I said, several reports that show that when they do take these steps, they actually increase their profits because they're capturing elements that they can then process and sell rather than burning them off or releasing them to the atmosphere. So I would like to speak in favor of these rule changes. As an oil and gas industry insider for 44 years, I, I see it can be benefit to both the population of New Mexico and the industry. And thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ms. Koch. Uh, I will move now to David Koss. Hi, I'm here. Hello. Um, if you would please spell your name for the record. Yeah, it's David, D-A-V-I-D, Koss, C-O-S-S. -S. All right, if you'd raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm to tell the truth? I do swear that. Thank you so much. I'll start your five minutes now. Oh, five minutes. Well, I thought it was just two, but I'm, I'll just take a couple. Uh, uh, Ms. Orth, it's good to see you. Uh, thank you for giving me an opportunity to speak this morning. My name's David Koss and I, I live in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Uh, but I do have some statewide experience from working for the land office and the New Mexico Environment Department. I just wanted to speak in favor of these regulations. I, I am just very pleased that those are that these are proposed and being looked at now. I think they're essential to our quality of life in New Mexico. I want to thank Governor Michelle Lujan Grisham and her administration for putting for putting this forward and doing this difficult work. You know, I, I think one of the proudest achievements of my generation and actually before my generation was the Clean Air Act. And uh, I've seen a lot of work at implementation of that in New Mexico over the decades. And I think it's about time we apply that act to the oil and gas industry as well. The other thing I do is uh, I go quail hunting once a year down in Carlsbad. I love the Chihuahuan Desert down there. But I've just seen the impacts, the flaring at night, the flaring all day long, the leaky gas lines all over uh, the area. Uh, those impacts are, are personal to me, but I got to think they're even more personal to the people that live down there. And so I'm in favor of these rules because of the health impacts on our communities in New Mexico from being an ozone non-attainment day after day, year after year something that uh, we used to just say we can't do anything about, but here we have the administration saying, actually, we think we can, and we've proposed a way through regulation to address this issue that affects so many of our, so many of our New Mexico residents. Uh, finally, I'd just like to thank the Environment Department. You know, I worked there for a long time. I understand how difficult and complex these types of regulations are. So I, I commend the department for proceeding with this. And I'm thankful that uh, we're at this stage in New Mexico, finally, where we're going to apply the Clean Air Act. And I, uh, I am in favor of these regulations and I thank you uh, for this opportunity to give my opinion and, and thanks to the Environmental Improvement Board for considering all this. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Koss. Uh, the uh, final speaker I have who requested a slot this morning is Marla Mead. Uh, Ms. Mead, can you hear me? Yes, I can. All right, if you would please uh, spell your name for the transcript. Marla, M-A-R-L-A, Mead, M-E-A-D. Thank you, and raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm to tell the truth? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. I'll start your five minutes now. Um, I am from Silver City. I am a native of Silver City. Lived in New Mexico almost all my life. I've also lived in Socorro and McKinley counties. 
I am a product of the education system in New Mexico, and I know that it is greatly impacted by the amount of funding that is given through the oil and gas industry. Um, my county in itself, although not directly related to the gas and oil industry, has over a thousand jobs. And considering the way the mining industry also fluctuates, which is what we base a lot of our income on, um, it's important to have those jobs as stable as possible. Uh, my concern is the fact that New Mexico is last in so many areas across the United States. We're 48th, 49th, 50th in a lot of areas. And although money is not the only solution in that area, reduced money can definitely affect the quality of life for both um, those of us now and our upcoming grandchildren and on further than that. So my concern is definitely, part of my concern is the funding that affects the schooling and, this, and also the universities that we face um, if, if there are significant cuts in the industry's ability to provide that. It did provide over a third of the state's income last year. And so that is important, I think, to all New Mexicans. Um, one of the questions I had for the board was, I know that the environmental department had done a modeling study um, on controlling oil and gas emissions, and it came out that it was the emissions were negligible to affecting the ozone. And so I'm going like, okay, if it's negligible effect according to your study, why are we putting in place a rule that supposedly will improve the quality of air? Those two don't don't seem to fit to me. Um, so I. I have a question about the validity of the rule because of that. Um, I do think we need to, to target pollution. I do think the Clean Air Act is important, but I think we need to target overall uh, pollutants, not just one industry. And it feels to me like this is just one industry and they're focusing on it. Also, having worked in the mining industry, I know that one size doesn't fit all. When I worked there, we had mines that were less than 100 miles apart, and the needs of those particular mines were completely different. And so I believe that because of the difference in the Permian Basin and the San Juan Basin and some of the small, especially the small providers, that it is important to consider the cost to them. Yes, maybe the big producers won't be affected much, but the small producers that do contribute may be gravely affected by that. Um, I would hope that there won't be any duplications of federal laws. Um, I think that's very burdensome to have laws that are already in effect be duplicated. I'm hoping that the regulation will not do that. And I feel that one size fits all does not, like I said before in the mining industry, one size fits all did not work there. And it doesn't, I don't think it will work within the gas and oil industry. I do believe there needs to be a flexible consideration out there for protecting that. But I do not feel that um, a strict adherence or a strict rule will help the industry across the board. Um, I want to thank you for allowing me to speak today. And um, I am hoping that you will consider all New Mexicans as you consider this rule. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Mead. Uh, we have come to the end of the uh, folks who wanted to offer public comment this morning. There are 11 other opportunities, uh, nine, one, and five each day. So at this point, we will return to the technical case uh, and uh, the uh, council agreed uh, that today, immediately following public comment, we would turn to pneumatics. So, Ms. Katz, I see you on screen. Good morning, Madam Hearing Officer, Madam Chair, and members of the board. 
uh, the department calls uh, Liz Bisbee Keen and Brian Palmer once again. Um, this uh, this testimony is pertains to section twenty point two point fifty point one twenty two pneumatic controllers and pumps. The department's testimony on this appears uh, begin in NMD exhibit 32 beginning on page 122 and NMD exhibit, sorry, rebuttal exhibit one beginning on page 82. Uh, Ms. Keene will need uh, sharing privileges. There she goes. And Ms. Keene and Mr. Palmer have already adopted this testimony on the record, and I don't believe there are any errors in it, so we can move forward. Um, Ms. Keene, can you please uh, summarize and discuss the equipment that is the subject of this section of the rule? Yes, good morning, everyone. Uh, this morning we'll be talking about pneumatic controllers and pumps in section uh, 122 of our proposed rule. I'm sorry to interrupt. Um, Madam Hearing Officer, Mr. Palmer. Oh, there he is. Sorry. <laughs> he got him. Okay. Great. Pneumatic controllers and pumps are process uh, control devices used throughout the oil and gas sector uh, to control po the position of valves. Natural gas powered pneumatic controllers use natural gas as motive force to operate valves that regulate safety shutdown, position, fluid level, pressure, temperature, and flow rate. They also may be powered by uh, compressed air. They are used to control multiple processes based on a sensed process parameter, such as a liquid level in a tank or separator. And they can also be used as emergency shutoff devices to regulate flow, uh, liquid levels, or liquid levels, or as temperature and pressure regulators. An example is a control liquid level in, in a separator. When that liquid reaches a, a certain set point in the separator, Based on the setting of a gauge, the associated pneumatic controller then sends a signal to open the control valve between the separator and the tank. This signal would consist of pressurized gas turning the valve from the closed to the open position. And when the level in the separator reaches a low level, that pneumatic controller sends a signal to the control valves to close and to stop flow from the separator to the tank. VOC and methane emissions occur from natural gas powered controllers when the pressurized gas is directed to the atmosphere after the control action is performed. Pneumatic pumps inject chemicals into the well bore, circulate glycol, and move liquids. VOC and methane emissions occur from pneumatic pumps when the pressurized gas used to drive the pumping action is released to the atmosphere after the pumping action. And the quantity of VOC emitted is dependent on the type of pump employed and the concentration of VOC in the gas stream. Natural gas driven pneumatic controllers and pumps are available in a variety of designs and are characterized by their bleed rate, which is a measure of how much natural gas is used to operate the controller or pump. Continuously bleeding controllers or continuous bleed controllers emit or bleed natural gas on a continuous basis. When the process condition rises or falls above or below that set point, the pneumatic controller responds to return the process to the predetermined set point. Continuous bleed controllers may either be a low bleed controller which has a bleed rate or an emission rate less than or equal to six standard cubic feet per hour, or a high bleed controller, which has a bleed rate or emission rate of, of greater than six standard cubic feet per hour. Intermittent controllers do not vent continuously, but instead release gas only when they open or close a valve. 
or as they adjust to gas flow. The bleed rate from these controllers depends on the amount of gas vented per actuation and the frequency of actuation. And zero bleed pneumatic controllers do not bleed natural gas at all. Those are self-contained units that release gas um, back into the process. And Ms. Keene, can you discuss some of the emission control options for pneumatic controllers and pumps? Yes, uh, there are several ways to reduce emissions from pneumatic controllers, including replacing high bleed controllers with low bleed or zero bleed models, using instrument air rather than natural gas to drive the controller, using non gas driven controllers, such as mechanical or electric controllers, they're all also requiring regular maintenance and proper adjustment of pneumatic controllers can be used to minimize emissions by repairing leaks and optimizing the amount of gas needed to operate the device. And options for reducing emissions from pneumatic pumps include using instrument air rather than natural gas to drive the pumps, also using non-gas driven pumps such as electric pumps or routing emissions to a control device or process. And, and turning to Mr. Palmer, um, can you discuss the basis for the proposed requirements for pneumatics and the estimated emission reductions and costs? Yes, I can. Um, the department's proposal is based on the concepts developed by Colorado, um, but with some important differences that were intended to simplify the approach. Um, it requires that operators convert a certain percentage of their controllers to be non-emitting controllers um, through 2030. It has graduated requirements depending on the number of non-emitting controllers that an operator starts with. Um, <clears throat> so those with lower numbers of, of non-emitting controllers have a, have a relatively lower target. Um, Final target. Uh, some differences in between the department's proposal and Colorado's Regulation 7. The department's proposal does not exempt low producing wells as Regulation 7 does. Uh, Regulation 7 has an exemption for um, operators who have an average of low producing wells. And then maybe in the department's proposal, is also based on the total controller count, whereas Colorado's Reg 7 is based on production amounts. And there's an important distinction is that Colorado <clears throat> has for several years other regulations in place that have already addressed emissions from pneumatics, um, in particular to reduce the frequency of malfunctioning pneumatics. The department's proposal provides similar flexibility as Colorado's Regulation 7. It allows operators to prioritize high producing production facilities. It includes exceptions for certain temporary controllers or those used in specific circumstances. It allows for emitting controllers for safety and process purposes. It also contains options for complying with the requirements there's built into the proposal an off ramp if owners meet a 75% target for non emitting controllers by January 1st, 2025. And then also, if after January 1st, 2027, there are still some remaining units that are not cost effective to retrofit, an owner may submit an analysis to the department of the retrofit costs um, for the department's consideration. We estimated the overall emission reduction from the department's proposal to be 31,347 tons per year of VOC as a result of the rule. These reductions are achieved at an estimated cost effectiveness of $2,475 per ton of VOC on an overall basis. And the cost effectiveness is based on costs from the US EPA's um, study called Lessons Learned, converting gas pneumatic controls to instrument air 
and that was in October 2006. That was part of the EPA's natural, natural gas star program. Thank you, Mr. Palmer. Uh, Ms. Keene, can you please discuss the definitions um, from section seven of the rule that are pertinent to the pneumatic controller section in one, section 122? Yes, the first definition is bleed rate, which I just discussed, which is the um, rate in which in standard cubic feet per hour at which gas is continuously vented from a pneumatic controller. There were revisions made to clarify um, that many different types of gas may be used in the pneumatic controller and also that bleed rate is more typically referred to those continuous bleed pneumatic controllers and intermittent um, controllers don't vent continuously and so um, are not appropriate to have a specified bleed rate, but um, have an, an actuation rate and, and their emission rate is, is dependent on the actuation rate and the, the length of actuation. Uh, the definition of non-emitting controller was requested and, and we agreed to adopt that, that definition and clarifies that um, control devices that are routed to a, a control, uh, controllers that are routed to a control device can be considered a non-emitting controller for the purposes of this part. We also received a request from stakeholders to uh, break out the definitions of pneumatic controllers to distinguish between high bleed, low bleed, and intermittent controllers. I've already discussed uh, the bleed rates or and emission rates associated with each one of those types. And so I won't read this for you all, but uh, we thought that those were a good additions to, to the regulation to the extent that they um, help distinguish between different types of controllers. And it may be uh, ultimately that um, depending on how how the board decides to move forward on this section that that certain um, definitions may no longer be appropriate if they're not relevant to the section. And can you um, summarize the provisions of the rule, um, the including the emission standards and the um, the revisions that uh, NMED is proposing uh, based on input from the stakeholders? Yes. Um, the department reviewed um, extensive comments and proposed revisions to this section in the direct testimony and rebuttal testimony submitted by um, EDF, CCP, NAVA, NAMOGA, IPANM, OXY, GCA, CDG, and Kinder Morgan. Uh, those comments are are far too numerous and pervasive to address here today. Um, on a broader level, much of the testimony from certain parties uh, proposes adoption of the regulatory approach to pneumatic controllers adopted in February 2021 by Colorado as part of its regulation seven. The department does not believe that the Colorado approach is appropriate for New Mexico. And while there are general statements about the benefits and workability of the Colorado approach, they have not been described or demonstrated how um, the department's proposal is unworkable or inappropriate for New Mexico. Um, and nor does that conclusion follow from the comments that have been provided. The department does not agree um, with, the, with the proposed adoption of, or with the, the parties proposals to adopt the approach taken in Colorado, which regulates pneumatic controllers on the basis of the total historic liquids production rather than controller counts. Um, as stated by Mr. Palmer, Colorado has an extensive um, infrastructure and regulatory approach to for pneumatic controllers that has been in place uh, since 2009. And it's something that the department's regulatory approach simply simply lacks. And so um, the result of those prior regulatory efforts is that New Mexico or is that Colorado through Rig 7 
has already achieved significant reductions in the overall number of high blade pneumatics and their associated emissions and has implemented ro a robust inspection and monitoring program to oversee the proper operation of those devices. And therefore, Colorado has already uh, re reduced emissions by replacing uh, large numbers of high blade pneumatics and reducing emissions from pneumatic controller malfunctions um, before it established the newer targets for non-emitting controllers based on company-wide production. Um, and the department's proposal, while premised on a similar but much more straightforward concept than that used by Colorado, um, does not have the similar advantage of building regulatory provisions off of emission reductions, reductions achieved by past regulatory efforts. As a result, the proposed revisions to this section or the proposed provisions of this section will likely achieve higher emission reductions from pneumatic controllers by re targeting reductions in the overall number of emitting controllers rather than by reducing the fraction of controllers represented by a certain percentage of overall production. At the same time, the department's proposed approach will also address emissions from pneumatic controller malfunctions by establishing monitoring requirements for all pneumatic controllers to ensure they're functioning properly and emitting only when they should be. We have received um, opposing comments from, from the parties. Um, the environmental NGOs initially had agreed to this concept. I, um, since then, they have worked on a, a different proposal with Oxy that's reflective of a production based approach. Um, in addition, a Numoga similarly um, opposed this concept, but we've, we believe now that they are in general support of the department's concept. Um, despite all of the different uh, comments that we've received on our concept, the department has retained um, kind of its original framework for regulating pneumatics. We think it is the a right approach for New Mexico. It works best for the department. None of the comments that have been provided by the other stakeholders have demonstrated why this proposal is unworkable or shouldn't be adopted. So before you, and I, I just wanted to kind of say all of that, initially so that you have some context for evaluating um, this, this section of the, the rule. You'll be receiving different um, different testimony from the other parties on their proposals later on. So before before us um, on the screen are the, the requirements for pneumatic controllers and pumps. The applicability section again identifies those units that are subject to the rule. The emission standards establish uh, the requirements for specific equipment. Um, and it requires new pumps and controllers to um, comply with the requirements of this part upon startup. It establishes a, a schedule for existing um, pneumatic controllers, and it requires that existing pneumatic pumps comply with the requirements within three years of the effective date of this part. Table one and two provide uh, the schedule for complying with a percentage of non-emitting controllers by certain timelines. And I will go into how that calculation is, is made on the next page. Um, but just to, to discuss this table in a bit more detail right now, if you are an operator of a well site tank battery gathering and gathering and boosting station, you first determine what your total historic percentage of non-emitting controllers are, and you then find within that first column what your where your percentage falls within those five categories. That percentage then determines how many uh, total required percentage of non-emitting controllers you have to meet by the next three deadlines. And there are um, staggered additional requirements over those those time frames. And so, if you were a owner of a well site and you had 20% of your 
um, controllers were a non abating controller, you would be in that, that fourth line down between 20 to 40%. Um, actually, you would be in the first line, so you'd be between zero and 20%. So your next, um, your requirement would then be to have a total required percentage of non emitting controllers by January 1st, 2024. So if you were at 20%, you must retrofit um, emitting controllers to not to a non emitting controller 5% um, of your fleet by January 1st, 2024. And uh, then you would need to meet a 65% total requirement percentage of non-emitting controller by January 1st, 2027. And then you would need to meet an 80% um, requirement by January 1st, 2030. And I know there'll be a lot of questions about how all of this works. Um, so I, I'm available to answer any other questions as we um, at the conclusion of the PowerPoint. This next slide addresses um, the standards for non for natural gas driven controllers, new pneumatic controllers are required to have Ms. Keen. zero. Yeah. Sorry, Ms. Keen. Can you maybe just jump back and just mention the the table two and just what it its distinction from table one? Oh sure. So table one targets well sites, tank batteries, and gathering and boosting stations, and table two targets transmission compressor stations and gas processing plants, and they have different sets of um, required percentages based on um, their access to line power, um, primarily. Thank you. Paragraph four establishes requirements for or establishes the emission standards for um, natural gas driven pneumatic controllers. 4A requires new pneumatic controllers to have an emission rate of zero. Um, 4B uh, was amended with a with language to require that existing pneumatic controllers with access to commercial line power shall have an emission rate of zero within two years of the effective date of this part. We do we did receive a comment that they that this is, this is problematic and in conflict with the requirements in Table Two. And so um, the department intends to to strike that that language and have owners and operators of pneumatic controllers um, meet the requirements of, of table one and two. That is more clear, and that was the department's intent. Paragraph 4C um, outlines the process by which owners and operators of existing pneumatic controllers have to determine what percentages they have to meet. So the first step is by January 1st, 2023, those operators need to determine the total controller count for all controllers at all of the facilities owned by that operator that commenced construction before the effective date of this part. The total controller count must include all emitting controllers and non emitting controllers except that those controllers that are necessary for a safety or process purpose that cannot otherwise be met without emitting natural gas do not need to be included in the total controller count. Those are tracked separately. The operator then has to determine which controllers um, in the total controller count are non-emitting and sum those and designate those as total historic non-emitting controllers. And then they determine the, the overall percentage by dividing the total historic non emitting controller count by the total controller count and multiplying by 100. And again, based on that percentage that's calculated in, in this step above, the owner operator then determines which provisions of tables one or two apply and the replacement schedule that they must meet. This section contains an additional provision that if they, if an owner or operator meets at least a 75% total non-emitting controller count by January 1st, 2025, that the owner or operator has, um, is not subject to the requirements of, of tables one and two. We think that's an important flexibility that um, streamlines the retrofit um, of emitting, of high emitting controllers. 
in addition, this regulation allows that if after January 1st, 2027, an owner or operators remaining pneumatic controllers are not cost effective to retrofit, that they may submit a cost analysis of retrofitting those remaining units to the department and the department shall review those to determine whether or not those those units qualify for a waiver for meeting the additional retrofit requirements. Paragraph D authorizes the use of emitting pneumatic controllers when it's based on functional needs, um, including response time, safety, and positive actuation. And an owner or operator that's seeking to maintain the, the operation of that unit must prepare and justify the need for that safety or pro process purpose prior to the installation of a new unit or the retrofit of an existing unit. And we were requiring that that justification be also certified by a qualified professional or in-house engineer. There are also um, two additional um, paragraphs that we have included based on feedback from stakeholders that one is that um, temporary pneumatic controllers that are used for well abandonment activities or prior to the end of flowback and controllers used as emergency shutdown devices are not subject to this section. And we've also added a paragraph that temporary or portable controllers that are on site for less than 90 days are not subject to the requirements of this section. Paragraph five sets the standards for pneumatic pumps, pneumatic diaphragm pumps. Uh, paragraph 5A requires that new pneumatic diaphragm pumps located at gas plants have an emission rate of zero and that new pneumatic diaphragm pumps located at those facilities listed um, that have access to commercial line power have an emission rate of zero. And we have added a clarifying um, paragraph for existing pneumatic di diaphragm pumps located at well sites, tank batteries, gathering boosting stations, gas plants, and transmission compressor stations with access to commercial line power have an emission rate of zero within two years of the effective date of this part. And a requirement that owners and operators of pumps located at um, those facilities listed without access to commercial line power shall reduce VOC emissions from the pumps by 95% and if it, if it is technically feasible to route those to a control device. And if there is not technically, if there's a control device available, but it is um, that unit is unable to achieve a 95% emission reduction and it is not technically feasible to route the pump to a fuel cell or process, that the owner operator shall still um, route the, the pump emissions to the control device. And that must occur within two days of the effective date, two years of the effective date of this part. Uh, paragraph six, which required the in installation or the, the use of an equipment monitoring tag as been struck. And now we'll get to the general monitoring requirements, which are in um, paragraph C. The first paragraph just to states clearly that pneumatic controllers of pumps that don't use natural gas or other hydrocarbon gas as a mode of source force are not subject to the requirements of this subsection. Um, paragraph two requires uh, owners and operators of a natural gas driven pneumatic controller subject to the deadlines in the tables, table one and two, shall monitor the compliance status of each pneumatic controller. Paragraph three requires that the owner operator conduct a monthly um, AVO, audio, visual, oral factory, or OGI inspection, and shall also inspect the pneumatic controller and perform necessary maintenance, and to maintain the unit in accordance with the manufacturer specifications to ensure VOC emissions are minimized. Four, paragraph four requires the owner operator to to monitor all of these elements, including the controller and an ID number, the type of controller, whether it's continuous or intermittent, and then the either the bleed rate or the emission rate um, of, of each controller. 
paragraph 5 establishes a requirement to inspect diaphragm pumps also on a monthly basis and to conduct an AVO or OGI inspection and also perform necessary maintenance to ensure that VOC emissions are minimized. We have added a paragraph 6 to the under the monitoring requirements. This requires pneumatic controllers to comply with the LDAR requirements of paragraph 3 of subsection C of 116. Those, um, those fugitive leak detection and repair requirements will be discussed um, in extensive detail tomorrow. In essence, it requires uh, the use of an OGI um, infrared camera um, or other type of technology to identify, to, to search for leaks um, when the unit is is in actuating to um, to determine whether or not the intermittent controller is malfunctioning. Again, that that type of controller shall only should only be emitting when it's actuating. And so the, this type of leak detection survey will um, help ensure that those units are operating as intended and not not malfunctioning and resulting in in um, increased emissions. Paragraph seven requires the owner operator to date and timestamp any monitoring event. And it looks like we have a numbering um, error here, so we'll need to update um, that number. That last um, requirement to update that to a new paragraph eight. The record keeping requirements again are, are straightforward. They're recording the information that's that's required to be monitored. The first paragraph clear, clears, um, clearly states that the controllers and pumps that are not subject to the record keeping requirements, the, I'm sorry, non-emitting controllers and pumps are not subject to the record keeping requirements of this part. Um, paragraph two requires owner operators to maintain the record of the total controller count for all affected facilities and the total controller count must include all emitting and non emitting controllers. Paragraph three requires the owners and operators to maintain a record of the total controller count of total count of natural gas driven pneumatic controllers necessary for process or safety purpose. Paragraph four um, details the schedule and the compliance deadlines um, for each pneumatic controller. This ensures that the owner, this requires the owner operator to develop the schedule and the compliance timelines for each subject controller. The paragraph five identifies the type of records that must be kept for each um, inspection of the unit and information on the controller type and emission rate any maintenance and any maintenance um, activity associated with that controller. Um, paragraph six identifies the record that must be kept for pneumatic controllers that have a bleed rate greater than six standard cubic feet per hour. And paragraph seven are the record keeping requirements for pneumatic pumps. Um, those include um, natural gas, um, a record of those pumps that are in operation for less than 90 days, a record of the control device being used to achieve at least a 95% emission reduction, and the records of the engineering assessment um, and certification by the qualified professional or in-house engineer. And we received no other, no other comments on this, this section. Thank you, Ms. Keen. Um, I believe that's all for the um, department's presentation of its summary of this section. All right, thank you, uh, Ms. Katz, uh, Ms. Keen, and Mr. Palmer. Uh, Ms. Katz, as I understand it, uh, this is one of the two remaining topics where we will uh, return to uh, cross-examination by other parties, and also board questioning uh, of each panel. Okay, before we return to the new system we had for the smaller topics. All right, 
so please, if you are a party uh, or council and you have questions of the department panel, turn on your camera. Not seeing anyone. Uh, in that case, I will turn to the board. Oh, I see Mr. Heiser. Mr. Heiser. Thank you, Madam Hearing Officer. We have a few questions, I think, on some details to understand the implementation approach that's recommended by the department. Thank you, Ms. Keene and Mr. Palmer for a very concise explanation of a very complex proposal. We appreciate it. Uh, Ms. Keene, you stated in your direct or your summary that industry could retrofit or reduce emissions by using a low bleed device but you actually would mean that we'd have to switch to a non-emitting device to fully comply with the requirements of your proposal. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. Um, and then is it the department's intent to allow like kind replacement of existing controllers rather than treating them as new, a new controller if we have to replace one so that we don't have an inadvertent or unplanned uh, conversion of a facility? That's correct. Um, and then in proposed section 20.2.50.122B4D, and I don't know if you may want to put that up on the screen just so you have it to look at in the board as well. And I've got a couple of questions which are sort of down in the weeds, and I appreciate that. I apologize for that. And I'm not yet seeing the screen. Um, one, one second. Okay. Take your time. So, yes, there you were. Um, so I guess I had a couple of questions are that this provision starts off by talking about a pneumatic controller with a bleed rate greater than six standard cubic feet is permitted when the owner operator makes a certain demonstration in the first sentence. And then in the second sentence, you simply say an owner operator that seeks to maintain operation of an admitting pneumatic controller must prepare and document the justification for the safety and process purpose. Um, in your discussion, it seemed a little bit unclear whether this demonstration and professional engineer or en in-house engineer certification applied to all devices that we were trying to maintain, just those over six standard cubic feet, or how exactly it interplayed with the requirements. Yeah, so this, this language, in we intended to require a justification for um, continuing to operate an emitting controller, an existing controller that in initially it was for emitting controllers with a, an emission rate greater than six standard cubic feet per hour. But um, it makes more sense to require the demonstration for units that are emitting above zero. And so um, we will have, um, we will need to make some adjustments to this, this paragraph to make that clear. So the requirement should read a pneumatic controller with a blade rate greater than zero is permitted when the owner or operator has demonstrated that it is required based on functional needs, including response time, safety, and positive actuation. And then we will need to make an adjustment that the owner operator that seeks to maintain operation of um, an emitting controller. I, I actually think that that language is clear as it as is and may not need to be um, revised. Okay, and so I guess the next question comes up is that this is a phase out proposal. Some controllers are going to be subject to the phase out some will still be allowed to be existing under the department's proposal. Uh, the intent of this provision is only to reach those that the operator is trying to take out because it's being used for a, because of response time safety or positive actuation, correct? And not any controller that's being 
uh, retained under the phase out schedule. That's correct. Okay. Um, and then and I'm sorry to keep hammering at this, but I'm trying to understand a little bit. What's the time frame within which we need to make that determination? Because this appears to apply immediately, but would it only apply as we find a controller that meets that requirement and that we would otherwise be phasing out at a facility? Or do we need to try to, before this rule becomes effective, identify every controller that we think meets this criteria before the effective date? So ideally they would be identified along with the list of the total controller count um, by January 1st, 2023. Okay. So your intent was to was to use that January 20, January 1, 2023 is sort of the date to complete a number of these requirements. Yes. Uh, and is that true of a number of the, a number of the monitoring provisions, I think in section C have sort of a similar issue to them where they're just stated as the positive monitoring obligation. And it appears they start as of the date of the effective date. Was it your intent to ratchet all those in immediately or only some of those requirements consistent with maybe looking at that January 2023 date for identification? And this was something that struck me as I was listening to your explanation. And so I'm sorry, we hadn't raised it before. No, that's that's a good point. And so the, the monitoring requirements typically are in effect when the emission standard requirements are in effect. Um, but in this case, I, you know, it, I don't think it makes sense to require to, to have delayed monitoring, you know, for those units that aren't going to be covered until 2027 or 2030. And so um, we'll have to we'll have to look at that. But my in, initial reaction is that um, these monitoring requirements, if it's not clear in the Eldar section, which I'll need to check. I'll need to check on that. Um, that these monitoring requirements um, come into effect by January 1st, 2023 as well. Okay. We appreciate the consideration of that and just making sure that things sort of line up in a logical way so that the, the, we can roll the program out in an organized fashion. Thank mm -hmm. you for your discussion of that. I really appreciate it. Um, and then in the 75% provision, which I believe is found just up above this, and the slide right before uh, where the department has proposed what I'll call sort of an early adopter provision in C B4 C5, that if the owner operate meets at least 75% total non-emitting controllers by January 1, 2025. Um, there are two questions on that. First is, is this a different count in some way than the count that's being done for tables one and two? Or is it just meant to be the sum total of, of the controllers that are in table one and two? We're just trying, the wording is a little bit different. We're trying to understand exactly if we're looking at a different universe a little bit than in the other ones. Um, I'm sorry, can you re repeat your question? Yes, just a strong. So is the, is the count for C5 meant just to be the count of the total historic emitting controllers, or is it meant to be um, total total controllers, both non-emitting and historically emitting? Um, it's meant to be both. Okay. Total non-emitting controllers, yeah. Okay. And then a question that has come up uh, and which we'd hoped your testimony would resolve, but it didn't quite clear it up for us is, is this, is the January 1st, 2025 date, the by in front of that meant to mean by that date and before, 
or does it mean as of that date only? And the reason it makes a difference is because of how the, this provision would interact with table one. In other words, so if I have a facility that's at say 75% uh, as of the effective date, does that qualify for this exemption in C5 immediately? Or does it still need to make the first level of emissions reductions required by 2024 in the table one? We're just trying to understand whether it's 75% and you're complete under this provision, or if we would have to go to 80% and then you'd be stay at 80% thereafter. This is for owners and operators that are meeting no it's if you have a 75 percent total non amended controller today you you don't automatically qualify for this exemption you, you do need to still go through the process and to determine what your total percentage amount is and then meet those at least that first set of requirements to add um an additional percentage of non emitting controllers to your fleet and then if you have at that point, met at least 75%, um, you would have met the requirements of the of the rule. Okay, so as the department's looking at this, if I if the 75% is determined as of that date and it determines your requirements from that date going forward, but it doesn't change the requirements in table one as it relates to the 24, 2024 okay. timeframe. That's correct. Okay, we just wanted to make sure we understood the department's intent. Um, for that. Um, I believe those were the primary questions that I had and mostly to help us understand uh, the intent behind your proposal. Thank you very much, Ms. Keen, Mr. Palmer, for your uh, explanation of this complex proposal. Uh, thank you, Mr. Heiser. Uh, any other parties with questions of the department panel, please turn on your screen. Not seeing anyone else, I'll turn to the board for their questions. While I'm doing that, if you're an attendee on the platform with a question, please reach out through chat. Madam Chair, do you have questions? Good morning, Madam Hearing Officer. I don't have any questions at this time. Thank you. Uh, Vice Chair Trujillo Davis. Uh, good morning. I don't have any questions at this time either. All right. Thank you. Uh, Member Cates. Uh, thank you. No questions here. Thank you. Member Bitzer. A couple of quickies, if I might. Uh, it's probably a no-brainer, but what's instrument air? Is that nitrogen, oxygen, outside air, or is there something different about it? No. Uh, yes. Go ahead, Brian. Um, instrument air just refers to compressed air that has been um, that has been dried to remove any moisture from it. And then so um, compressed fresh air. Okay. And this one's probably for the environment department. Uh, uh, the proposed rule gives you some discretion in terms of waivers um, down the line. Uh, would your decision to grant those waivers uh, or not be based on how we're doing? overall in terms of uh, of hitting and retaining attainment if if we're if we're uh, if we're in dire straits then you're less likely to grant those waivers than if we're doing well and not and meeting the good neighbor rule and all that uh, is that is that going to be part of the criteria for deciding uh, whether to grant those waivers uh, no, Member Bitzer, it will be simply an economic analysis on the cost of retrofitting that that challenging site. Okay. That's all I have, uh, Madam Hearing Officer. All right, thank you. Uh, Member Garcia. So, Madam Hearing Officer, I do have a couple of questions. Um, similar to uh, Member Bitzer's question, I kind of was focusing on uh, the provision in um, and you could put up that slide if you wanted to, Ms. Keene, the same one you had up for Mr. Heiser, 
uh, only it's one more, it's B4, C, small Roman numeral six, where there is a provision for a waiver. Um, I see that the company can provide a cost effective analysis. Is this something that is uh, has been in rules before, or is this a new thing for this particular subpart? Um, thank you, Member Garcia. The department is um, has exercised its discretion to authorize this type of waiver process in a very, very limited manner. Um, and it's really in, in only those very, very specific situations where we think it's appropriate. And so you'll see um, we've offered this type of concept within the alternative emission standard within the engines and we've identified it here and those are really the only places where they where they exist in the rule in this rule um, and the, the Colorado's regulations do contain um, a, sa a similar type of provision that was going to be my next question whether this idea came from Colorado uh, so for this particular provision under Roman numeral six um, it says if after January 2027, um, the remaining uh, replacement of pneumatic controllers uh, is not cost effective, then they get a waiver. Is that is that forever? Is that they just don't have to do it as long as that analysis you you agree with the analysis? It would be um, so. Our concept allows um, flexibility to the, to the owner and operators to retrofit those units first at the cost effective um, at facilities where the retrofits are cost effective. And so they will be able to prioritize those cost effective retrofits um, initially and ongoing. And um, depending on an operator's unique set of circumstances, there may be um, some sites where it is just simply um, not not cost effective to make these retrofits, the waiver um, would be in effect um, would be effective um, permanently. Um, but you know, it's um, we think that this deadline is. Um, is appropriate because it achieves, you know, it, it it does achieve significant amounts of retrofits for those cost effective um, controllers initially. Um, and so it provides kind of a, an appropriate off ramp for some of these sites where it, it really is um, simply not not effective to, to make these kind of retrofits happen. Um, so, so I, I hope that answers your question. Yes, it does. Thank you. And and finally, if there's a disagreement, they provide a cost uh, analysis and you decide it's not uh, adequate reason to delay or not do it. Uh, do they have an appeal uh, ability? What would happen if there's disagreement? Uh, this is an action by the department and I, so that I think that action is appealable um, to the depart to a department. Um, Secretary. Okay. Okay. That's all I have. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Member Honker. Uh, yeah, just one question for uh, Ms. Keene, I guess. And apologies if you if you mentioned this and I missed it. But the, do you know where we're starting on this in terms of what the, the current percentage of non-emitting controllers is uh, industry-wide? In the state, I'll refer to Mr. Palmer. He may have some data to share on that. We do not have a great inventory of pneumatic controllers. Um, most much of our data was um, relied upon by the greenhouse gas reporting program and um, the CT the color, the control techniques guidelines that put out by EPA. Um, and Brian can can add to that. Yeah, um, 
That's actually a great question. And in our cost analysis, we assume 20% were non-emitting. Um, all I can say, my first response might be that, you know, industry members might be able to provide yeah. a, more, a better answer than I can. But we use 20% yeah. as a starting point for the cost analysis. Okay. All right. Thanks very much. That's all I have. All right. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Katz, will there be any follow-up? Um, I guess I'll just do one question for Ms. Keene um, to clear up a response to uh, Member Garcia's question. Um, would the um, waiver, the decision by the department not to grant a waiver be considered a final agency action that would be uh, by the department that would be appealable to the Court of Appeals? Or the Air Quality Control Act. Yes. Okay, that's all. All right, thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Ms. Katz, Ms. Keene, Mr. Palmer. Uh, as I understand it uh, from a uh, text uh, by agreement of counsel, uh, we'll be turning to Mr. McCabe uh, uh, because of his schedule. Ms. Fox? Oh, I see Mr. McCabe on screen. Looking for Ms. Fox or Mr. Bob. Hi. Yeah, it's going yeah. to be me. Um, hold on, my video doesn't want to work. Well, Mr. Bach is uh, turning on his video. Uh, I just wanted to take a moment to thank everyone for their flexibility and allowing me to um, testify now and work things into my schedule. All right. And while he's getting on, uh, if you would spell your name for the transcript, please. Yes, ma'am. Uh, David, D-A-V-I-D, McCabe, M-C-C-A-B-E. -C -C -E. Thank you. And raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm to tell the truth? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. I'm sorry. Um, let me just say, Mr. Bach, if your video is not working, um uh we i believe we could hear you pretty clearly your honor it was working this morning in a different platform and i think that's the problem is it um let me try i'm just joining again on my laptop um and if this doesn't work we can just proceed with with the audio all right um, well we'll wait a moment So I, uh, I just joined on my laptop. I think I, I need to be added as a uh, presenter. Oh. Well, on that other. Okay, I'm looking for you. There you are. Fantastic. Anytime you're ready. Okay, um, so, Madam Hearing uh, Officer, thank you again for accommodating. Hold, hold um, on, Mr. McKay. I, I just realized uh, I need to be able to share. Ah, all right, I'll do that right now. Um, so thank you again, everyone, for accommodating uh, Dr. McCabe's uh, schedule. And. We have the sharing capability. Not, not that I can see. Ah. Oh, I have. Um, uh, Mr. Bach, I think you're going to have to do it. It's not letting me. Okay. Um, can I have? Uh, can I have the sharing ability, Madam um, Hearing Officer? It. it it's dumping me into oh wait i see how to do it you know what i, I can do it wait uh, uh no, not that. you want me to you want me to do it david yeah i can't it, it won't let me turn it on okay 
Um, Madam Hearing Officer. Uh, Mr. Nykiel. I, I struggled with this myself and just one recommendation. I don't mean to delay things, but sometimes the newer WebEx platform that we're using requires the person to change the preferences on their computer and then restart the program. And that seemed to work for me. So just a word of advice. Thank you. That's helpful, Mr. Nykiel. Um, Mr. Bach, I've uh, transferred it back to you. Okay. Um, let's see. Um, maybe this maybe this would be a good time for a, a five minute break while we try to figure this out. I apologize for our technical incompetence here. Okay. Um, let's take ten minutes and come back at ten thirty five. Thank you, Madam. Thank you.